verse 12. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed with like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Paul, I want to express my appreciation to you for uh, filling in last week and preaching this week. Lord bless you. Well, it's good to be with you today, and it's Resurrection Sunday. Now, the passage that Bill read, as well as others, there are some preachers, pastors, that like to focus on certain nuances about those passages. But uh, you know, I spent a little time listening to a, a fairly popular pastor named Tim Keller. And according to Tim Keller, he says that those nuances really just point to the fact that this is a true account, that the male writers, Luke and John specifically, that they would have not included this account like the women, you know, engaging and coming back and tell them because of the male dominated society, they, they would have left that out if they really wanted to kind of boast their own status. And so for the nuances that are found in these passages, they really point to the authenticity of the account. Now keep that in mind because what I want to talk to you about today is a different matter. And as we celebrate this day as the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, the day that he was made alive by the power of God and for the fulfillment of scriptures, but do you know why God did this? Why? Why did Jesus go to the cross in the first place? Well, Bill mentioned it in the beginning of his pastoral prayer. Quite simply, it's love. You see, it was God's love for His sinful creatures that motivated Him, that provided Him with purpose, that brought Jesus to life in the first place, to live a certain way, and then to be crucified. Love for you. <laughs> Love for me. You see, from the very beginning of creation, Adam's sin has made us all enemies of God. Romans 5 puts it this way, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Likewise, in Colossians 1, 
Paul writes to us there, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Quite frankly, throughout our lives, we just continue to add to the sinful condition in which we were born in. Listen to the writer of Psalms 14, what he says about this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Now, can I just point out there's no wiggle room here, so everybody in here fits into that category, including me. In Romans, you know this, in Romans 3, it says there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, you know, these particular passages and this understanding of what God has done for us makes me wonder, how could He love any of us? Let alone me. Let alone you. How could he? How could he love the unlovable? That's hard to deal with sometimes. Well, let's work through that a little bit this morning. God's love is the motive behind everything that he does. It was the motive behind everything Jesus had done. His motive is love, and the outcome or the result of His love is His glory. He receives glory as a result of what He has accomplished because of His love. So about love, let's, you know, I, I, if you were here on Valentine's Day, I talked to you about that, and that our love is mostly based on an experience of some sort. You know, when you meet a new person, they might be physically attractive, you have a response to that. Their, their personality might be emotionally pleasing to you. When you taste new food, the, the physical taste, sometimes there's an emotional response to that. When your eye beholds beauty, like a sunrise or a sunset, a cute puppy, a new baby, maybe a Harley Davidson or a Ford pickup truck. Might be some beauty in your eyes when you see that. Certainly. But... Is that really true love? Is that biblical love? I mean, we throw around the word love to refer to all kinds of things. Love a book, love a movie, love a location, the mountains or the beach. We, we love food. You know, I'm, I'm a lover of oysters, and that's kind of a complex thing. But, but this is not new how we tend to throw around the word love all the time about various things. It's not new. Man has had this distorted view of love ever since the Garden of Eden. And quite frankly, we still do. In Genesis 3, it tells us there, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. This way of understanding love can drive us to have desires that we perceive as love. Our understanding of love, our expression of love, and this view of love is very different from God's view. Very different. And of course, we know that. We absolutely know that. If you've been around a church any amount of time throughout your life, you know this. God's ways are greater than our ways. Isaiah 55 tells us this. It's a famous passage. You probably know it. Where Isaiah speaking for God as a prophet, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God's love and his expression of love is very different from ours. And we have a little bit of a challenge trying to wrap that around or embrace it daily or hold on to it. Especially on a day like today. And godly love is love that God himself expresses with action. God's love is a verb. And you know that. It's a verb. John 3.16, the most famous passage that illustrates this is, For God so loved the world that He gave His only 
one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John also writes in his first letter, in 1 John, he says, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And th these few passages, as well as many others, tell of God's love having a divine purpose and a desired outcome. The, the, the divine purpose is that so that we shall not perish but have eternal life. And the desired outcome is that an eternal relationship with Him, reflecting His glory, worshiping Him, again, for all eternity. That He has taken a creature who deserves the exact opposite. But because He is a God of mercy and grace, He doesn't treat us as we deserve. So He has created, He planned, He purchased, He now applies His plan of salvation to those who express their faith in Christ to be able to reflect His glory for all eternity. And that ought to excite you. You see, that's the whole point of Resurrection Sunday. It's, this day represents the absolute full expression of God's love. So let me ask you then a few questions as I often try to do. Why should any of us care that God loves us? Why, why, or even believe that He does? I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, God doesn't love me. I see things happen in the world, even in my own life, that are not good. The, the world seems out of control. There's all kinds of just sin and debauchery. There's all kind of war and hate. There's all kinds of division out there. I, I don't make enough money to make it every month. I have trouble at work. My boss is hard to get along with. My subordinates are disobedient and disrespectful. I'm divorced. I'm single. I'm lonely. I can't get a job. I have a broken relationships with my adult children. I'm physically in pain all the time. I do not experience God's love at all. Well, I would say to you, wait, aren't you relating to God's love the way I just said we all experience love? Let me tell you, God has made everything in this world. He has done everything to perpetuate his plan for the entire planet he is working everything not only in your life but in the globe for the fulfillment of scriptures and for his own pleasure for his own glory it's all about him it's all about his timeline it's all about how he loves his creation in such a way that he will take that which deserves to be separated from him for all eternity and make the creation something that will reflect his glory back for all create for all eternity even the terrible things in the world like the murder of jesus and the terrible things that are going on in your life are for His divine purposes. If He would not exclude these terrible things like His own Son being murdered by the sinful Pharisees and use those for His own glory and quite frankly for yours, there, there's nothing coming into your life that He doesn't allow with divine purpose to conform you into the image of His Son. Because that's how much He loves you. He's not going to leave you in the place where you are rejecting Him, avoiding Him, not worshiping Him in your heart and mind. And everything He has got going on in the world and in your life is because He is rich in mercy due to the great love with which He has loved us. Let me share a few passages with you that affirm that. Proverbs 16 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for a day of trouble. Again, the sin of the Pharisees who murdered Jesus had a divine purpose. 
Lamentations 3 says, Who has spoken it? Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Let me remind you of the account in Genesis 50 of Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers and he went through almost a lifetime of tragedy after tragedy. Difficult circumstance after a difficult circumstance. And when he's finally able to confront his brothers who did this to him, most of us would say, man, he's going to smoke them jokers. But listen to what he said to them. Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Listen to a part of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, where he writes, and it's a common passage that talks about our sin issue, uh, Paul writes there, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live. You followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. These passages that I've shared with you this morning tell us that what we all deserve, what we deserve is death and separation from God for all eternity. But some of us, we're not treated as we deserve. We are loved by God, though we don't deserve His love. And He doesn't love us for any other reason other than His own mercy. And because it pleases Him to love us. It's not because we are the prettiest or the ugliest. I don't know if that's nice to say. It's not because we're the smartest or the not so smart. It's not because we're the wealthiest or the poorest. He loves us because He loves us. The motive is in Him, not in anything in us. And as Titus tells us in chapter 3, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. You see, we don't have a righteousness of our own. We would never have it. Our righteousness is imputed toward to us because of what Christ has done. We have a righteousness that belongs to Him that He gives to us at the point of our genuine salvation. And in Romans 5, we hear this. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. that While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if we have, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. You see, God demonstrated his love for us while you were still a sinner while I was still a sinner, while you were unlovable, while I was unlovable. And even when we were his enemy, God reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. I mentioned it last week, talking about the relationship between Peter and Jesus, that although Peter had broken the relationship with Christ, Jesus was the initiator of the restoration of the relationship. And this is the same concept for every person who becomes a Christian that God himself is the initiator to restore the relationship between the creator and the creature it has taken action on his part to be reconciled to us and that's the love in motion and action 
We need Jesus' death to replace the death that we deserve. You know that. We need His perfect life to replace our sinful life. And we have His resurrection proving that God accepted His sacrifice on our behalf. And here's the truth today. Jesus is God. He was born as a man. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. And He was treated as a criminal and put to death. And death is the just reward for sin. Except Jesus never sinned. And He wasn't treated as He deserved. He was treated worse. Yet, through our faith in Christ, we're we're treated better than we deserve. Because of His great love, God the Father saw fit to accept the life of Jesus as payment for the sins of His people. For you. For me. So that now, God can treat us, view us, relate to us as if we're His own Son. So, let me ask you, how can you get there? How can you experience that great love? Romans 10 puts it this way to answer that question. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Further on in chapter 10, Paul says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then further down in 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So what have you heard today? What have you heard today? Did you hear that God loves you? Did you hear that His love for you is action that results in His glory? Did you hear that Jesus exchanged His life for yours because He loves you that much? Now, you you need to also hear that God wants you to love Him back. (laughs) I wonder if you knew these things. That He wants you to love Him back. God wants from you what He has for you. Love. See, Resurrection Sunday is a day that we dwell on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead as proof positive that God the Father accepted His sacrifice as payment for sin and as a demonstration of how far God is willing to go to show His love for you. So today, how far are you willing to go to show your love for Him? Hebrews 12 gives us a glimpse of our limitations. Hebrews 12.4 says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You see, because none of us could have done that. Only God Himself could have provided the perfect life, the perfect sacrifice to satisfy the righteous requirements that sin demands so that God could express His love to a sinful creature to be able to share in His holiness for all eternity to reflect His glory back and to worship Him when we're all there in His presence fully. It's quite a contrast between our love for God and His love for us. And if you're here today and for the first time in your life, this actually makes sense to you. That God's not a God of anger and wrath and going to retribution all over you. That God is actually a God of love and He demonstrated it through His Son, His life and His death. And if you want to experience God's love through this unbelievable forgiveness, don't, don't let the day go by. You need to grab me or Bill this morning and let's have that conversation let's clear up the matter between you and God let us help you break sin's hold on your life but if you're here today a Christian and you would quite frankly be honest with yourself and say that you haven't been loving God in the way in which he loves you well 
Today's a new day. As Isaiah says, his mercies are new every morning. Today's a day to acknowledge that sin issue, to cry out to him for his strength, his help, his wisdom, and to help you be able to love him in the manner in which he wants you to love him back. To begin practicing today what you will do for eternity there. I mean, that's how we all change and grow into our image of Christ is we work today on what it means to be there because that is absolutely where we're all heading. That we will reflect His glory there. We can only get there in part now. But that doesn't alleviate the desire in our hearts to do that. And so God has made a way by His Spirit and His Word to help you get there. To demonstrate your love for Him. To demonstrate your love to other people. To demonstrate your love to each other in this room and in this community and in this state. Everywhere you go. So today is like no other day in the history of the world. No other day has someone been made alive who was literally and actually dead. And that, my friends, is the full expression of God's love for you. How will you respond? Let's pray. Our God and Father, how grateful we are that you have loved us in this way. That the full expression of your love can really only be understood in part in our lives today. But Lord, we know it to be true. Your word repeatedly demonstrates, tells us, as explains to us, and through the accounts, the historical accounts in the Bible, we know that it's a reality. So Father, as Your people have gathered here today to worship you and praise you as you have been the audience of our praise. Would you equip each of them to love you in a greater way, to demonstrate that love for you to other people. And may we be a people who leave here today confident in who you are and how you have loved us through our faith in Christ. And it is his name we pray. Amen.